start this recording, I will admit that although the content of what I'm delivering here is the same as what will be delivered at our in-person meetings on Sunday, the order in which it is being delivered is slightly different. To those of you who watch here and also read the sermon notes that get emailed out, your sermon notes are from the message delivered at our in-person service. Now, as prayer should be the basis on which anything we do for God is done, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the good things you give us. We're so grateful that you set everything in motion so that the sun rises on every day and that the seasons follow a set pattern. Lord, as we take time to consider what you have given to be shared today, inspire us to find applications for our lives so that we can glorify you. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Now, oftentimes, Christians can be asked the question, if you believe your God is loving, why does he send people to hell? I'm hoping that by the end of today's message, we'll see that God doesn't want to send anyone to hell. So where to begin? Well, let's begin at the beginning. I'm going to read from the book of Genesis and the end of chapter 1, a snippet from the middle of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. If you're watching this with your Bible, you may want to find the book of Genesis. So Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through to Genesis 2, verse 2, reads as follows. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Now jumping forward a bit, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we read, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it you will certainly die. And then finally in Genesis 3 verses 1 to 11 we read, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, we, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realised that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, 
Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So here we see at the very beginning, a time when God and humankind walked together in the garden and were able to talk freely. Human beings talk to God without fear or shame, and humankind, male and female, coexisted without any shame. Everything was laid bare, and there was no reason to hide. But then it changed. I want to explore a little bit what the change brought about. And I want to use a metaphor to do it. And I hope that this will lead us to the realisation that God does not want to send anyone to hell. So as we start, I want you to picture a train station. Now for those of you who are nearby to uh, Outreach Christian Centre in Darton, you may know Darton train station. And the station I'm thinking of is similar to Darton train station. Okay? It has two tracks that run through in opposite directions. The only difference that this train station has that I'm thinking of compared to Darton is Instead of two platforms on either side of the tracks, there is one platform straight down the middle. Now, have you got this picture in your head of this train station with two tracks and a platform in the middle? Now, a train station isn't much use without trains passing through, and as this station has two tracks running in opposite directions, that means that there must be trains that pass through in opposite directions. Now there is one difference with this platform and these trains and that is that nobody walks to the platform to catch a train. Everybody starts on one train and the platform is merely a means of changing trains. But the trains are frequent and so the opportunity to use the platform comes up quite frequently. Now it's at this early stage that I'd like to say that there weren't always two trains, or a platform. There used to just be one location, and that location was the presence of God. And we see at the very end of Genesis chapter 1 and at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve knew this location well. There was no striving, there was no hard work, there was no sickness, there was no illness, and, for the women who are listening to this message, no pain in childbirth. Humanity had the privilege to tend what God had created and everything was fresh and pure and pretty much on tap. You wanted food? You just picked it from the trees and the plants. You were thirsty? You drank from the nearest water source. Everyone's needs were met. How very different from where we find ourselves today. But Adam and Eve's actions brought about the trains and the platform. Well, more accurately, they brought about the first train. Now everybody starts on this first train and we're all heading in the same direction to the same destination. And our tickets are the same. Our tickets only allow us to ride on this first train. This train has no announcements. Although every now and then the announcements of the platform can be heard as it passes by. There are no announcements about where the train is heading though. However, most people seem happy to continue riding the train, even though they don't know where it is heading. For the most part, the journey of this train seems fairly free-flowing and there seems to be few issues. And when issues do happen, they seem to get sorted fairly easily too. The scenery, visible out of the window, seems pleasant enough, and every now and then the antics of the other people on the train also make the journey enjoyable. But, as Adam and Eve started in the original location, this first train can only be heading in one direction, away from it. So that's the train. But I can hear you saying, Adam Hammond, you said there were two trains. 
What about the second one? Well, the second train started off with nobody riding it. In fact, there was nobody with a ticket to ride this train, and there is nobody who can afford the ticket. But there were times where some people were given tickets to ride this train. They're mentioned throughout the Bible. Unlike the first train, this train announces quite clearly what its destination is. And those riding on this train also know where they were heading when on the first train. This train's journey has a lots of stops and starts along the way, but the promise of its destination means it's worth riding. Every now and then, the scenery outside of the train seems stormy, but it is worth sticking with the journey. You'll notice that I haven't told you the destination of either train yet, but there has been a hint at the destinations of both. So what am I trying to convey to you? Well, the trains are a picture of the journey of our lives. Now, granted, it's not a, a perfect fit, but all of our lives are a journey to somewhere. The first train represents the lives of everyone who doesn't know God. The second train represents those who know God and have placed their faith in Jesus. So you can probably fill in the blanks as to those destinations, right? The first train is taking us away from God's presence and eventually to its destination, hell. The second train is returning us to God's presence and its destination is heaven. And as I said just a few moments ago, it's not a perfect fit, but please post a question in the comments of this video if you'd like to know more. So let's wind back then to where we saw the beginning of that first train. Now God talks about it in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 of Genesis. And then we see it actually come to pass in Genesis 3. In the verses we looked at from Genesis 2, we saw that God said, You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So did Adam and Eve die immediately when they ate from the tree? No. But before eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would have lived forever. But now their lives are finite. They would certainly die. Why did eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil have such a dramatic effect? Well, that's because in the fruit of that tree, Adam and Eve saw an opportunity to replace God. They wanted to be God. They wanted to declare what was good and what was evil. And so that's what God allowed. He allowed them the access to the tree and they fell as they ate from it. They directly disobeyed God's command to them. And they earned their ticket to ride on that first train. Now in the New Testament we can read in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death. The ticket to ride that first train is that, death. Unfortunately, that is the ticket that we all receive when we're born. We inherit it from our parents, who inherited it from their parents, all the way back through the generations to Adam and Eve. And even if we happen to be born to parents who are believers, the ticket inherited through our humanity is the same. All of humanity is doomed to be forever transported away from the presence of God. The ultimate destination of this route, where there will be no God, is hell. It's not that God wants us to go there, because it hurts his heart. However, if you don't want God to be a part of your life, if you don't want to acknowledge him, why would you want to be in his presence for eternity? Why would you want to go to heaven? But you need to realise that if you don't want to go to heaven, where there is no God, there is no good. None of the good things that we see in the earth around us exists in hell. 
all of those good things are given by God and although our world is tainted by sin hell is far worse than what we experience in our earth and in our world today it's all not it's not all bad news though you see when the first train was put on the tracks God started the construction of the platform and set the other train on the tracks back to him in the very beginning Adam and Eve knew God but they chose to disobey when they had children some acknowledged God's role in creation and sought to give him the best of what they had in praise others less so as time progressed God tried his best to let mankind know the other train was there and some did indeed hear him in fact they were accepted by God and given the gift of a ticket to ride on the other train the ticket of life we know of Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abram and Moses and many others in between and after them who are listed in the Old Testament who heard God and met with him they didn't see the completion of the platform but were able to use it during its construction to change trains you see earlier on when I quoted from Romans I didn't give you a complete quote I started at the beginning of a sentence and finished in the middle you see in Romans 6 verse 23 we read for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord so even though Adam and Eve through their disobedience set their path away from God God still sought to provide a way back if anything, God wants us in his presence. He wants to restore all things to the way they were. Heaven is as the Garden of Eden was. No one suffering pain, no one going hungry or thirsty, no one knowing sorrow and everyone's needs being met. It sounds too good to be true, but it's the plan of a very good God. It's a plan of the one true God. And it always was. You're probably asking now, well this is all well and good Adam, but you told us that no one can afford a ticket for this second train. So you dangle this promise of heaven in front of us, but you don't tell us how to get there. How can we switch trains? Well remember back to when we were talking about the first train. I said that occasionally the announcements of the platform could be heard as it passed by. Well, here is one of those announcements. You see, the passengers on the second train have some responsibility for some of the platform announcements. You see, the platform is representative of Christ, the only way to switch trains construction of the platform God's plan was begun at the very beginning but was completed at just the right time as Romans 5 verses 6 to 8 tells us you see at just the right time when we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us you see no human being could afford the price needed to get on the train to life the wages of sin is death and all have sinned but one Jesus Christ you see, we have all earned death because we are inherently sinful. Even in our earliest stages of life, we show greed and selfishness. All we can lay our hands on is ours to do with as we please. Even from a young age, you'll see toddlers who will make a grab at other toddlers' toys and try to keep them for themselves. 
in families where a second child arrives, the first child shows jealousy of the second. As we grow up, the opportunities present themselves for our sinful nature to become even more apparent. We exclude some people from our, our group of friends because, you know, they, they're not like us. We don't want them to talk to. We're, we're going to stick with our group of friends. And then some of our other friends perhaps encourage us to, to shoplift a little bit or, you know, we, we do various things that clearly show that we're, we're only ever focused on what we want then maybe we get to the point where we can drive a car. And even that becomes a temptation to revel in our sinful nature. That car, it's, it's mine. And I'll decide who I give a lift to or don't. You know, it, it's not up to other people to use my car. You see, we're all deserving of the ticket we get. But was Christ deserving of his death on the cross? And here comes the mystery. You see, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and we can read it in our Bibles today in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our death, when it comes, is the result of our sin. I can die for no one because I have my own sin that earns me my death. Jesus' death, when it came, however, he had no sin to earn that death. You see, God sent himself in the form of Jesus to die for our sins. And because he had no sin, that meant that he earned that reward of death. He earned the death our sins should have earned for us. So now we can have the ticket of life, but only if we can declare that Jesus is Lord and believe that he was raised from the dead, as Paul wrote to the Romans. You see, in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, we read this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And so, Christ is the platform through which we get to ride on the train that takes us back into God's presence. But this leaves us with some challenges. For those of you watching this who may have never realised what God has done so that you don't have to continue to hell, maybe now is the opportunity to hear that distant platform announcement to change trains. For those of you who believe you are riding on the train, taking you into God's presence, are you making opportunities to make those platform announcements that need to be heard? And if you're on that train, are you living to give praise to God for what he has achieved for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in spite of our sin, you do not want to see any of us perish in hell. Father, please forgive us when we live in ways that are not the ways you want us to live. We thank you for the death of your Son on that cross to pay for the wrong that we do. We believe that you raised him from the dead. Lord, help us to live lives that glorify you and that give opportunity for others to see and hear of what you've done for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.